Hello and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer and joining me is a man who will be flipping his microphone all throughout this episode. So if the audio gets a little weird, it's because the microphone's over his head, behind his back. He's throwing it up in the air. It's spinning, but the audience loves it. It's Eric Hoffmeyer. Man, I've been practicing this all week for your viewers. They're going to love it. We're going to teach them some new tricks for the microphone. We're going to put it on your YouTube channel. It's going to be fantastic. So I have a YouTube channel, but it's only audio. No video whatsoever. But I can see it, Eric. And okay, I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll just let me tell you all what he's doing right now. Right now, he is he's he's kind of doing the Tom Cruise gyration and this flailing of arms, the bad dancing, and he's fl- hit for us. <laughs> and he's flinging <laughs> and he is flinging that microphone all over the place. Like just imagine a cross between <laughs> JCVD and Kickboxer and Tom Cruise and Cocktail. That's what Eric looks like right now. Remember, tip your bartender, folks. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, man. Like, if I was the owner of these bars that they work at, like they're they're at a seat, they're at like the yuppiest bar ever, and they're the only two bartenders in the joint, and they take seven minutes to make one drink. I would be furious if I was the owner. I'm like, listen, man, just pour the Jack Daniels into a cup and move on to the next person. I am losing hundreds of dollars a minute because you want to throw that Smirnoff bottle forty feet in the air. Like while it's in the air, you could pour a shot of Jägermeister, but you don't like make that money bartender. That's what I would say. Here's a better idea. Get some people who are actually working behind there (laughs) to balance it out, right? You got the, you know, the people who like to be entertained. Then you got the people actually getting the work done. Everyone wins. You're cranking out more, but they might've had more bars in that, that one giant club and cocktail. I mean, they might've had more, but that's the only one I really saw in the movie. You're going to be waiting all all the attention. Like if it, you know, it's just crazy. Like, you know what I would do? I would, I would hire. Exclusive. It's a very exclusive bar. Yeah. I would <laughs> no hire. No, no, that's why people love it. Yo, I waited three hours for a drink. And that dude spun a Smirnoff bottle 43 times. Like before he even poured one drink. I didn't even I get to $50 it. <laughs> for a cocktail. I got to watch people throw bottles in the air. I was like, hey, man, say, man, just throw them my way and I'll drink them. But it's, that's went full Mitch Hedberg there. But I would hire someone just to pour the beer or shots right but if someone orders a a mixed drink let the people shake the heck out of them let them flip the bottles but if someone's like hey man give me some rum does it matter no like okay give it to hank hank pours rum gives it to him like he doesn't need to spin the bottle like there, there needs to be no bottle flips. i don't know i i, I kind of i think all bars you need some differentiation right if you want a guy named just you know give me some rum or a beer you're not going to be at that bar I think each bar, if you go to New York, they all have like this different niche, the craft brews, the whiskey, the the high end cocktails, the party ones. This one in the movie cocktail is just for people looking to, I think, to be seen and, and be entertained. So I think there's room for the entertainment. I mean, really, all bartenders are basically performance artists anyway. I mean, if you're a bartender, people are staring at you all night, analyzing every little thing that you can do. I mean, think about it. What other job do you just sit there or be there and people just stare at you all night, <laughs> night <laughs> long? <laughs> but I don't, I like it. I mean, every bar is, you got to have a thing, right? Like if you, you know, if you just want a straight beer, go to your local pub or something. No, that's fair. I mean, listen, you're right. If, if people go to this bar to watch people flaying bottles into the ER, it's like, that's, that's what it is. But imagine you just walk in there one night and you're like, Poof, it was a hard day. Let's go in this bar. It looks popping. And then you wait seven hours for a Corona. Like it's, <laughs> it's not. Yeah, well, you know, what's funny is like when you walk into any, go, let's say you go to a new bar and you walk in and everyone just kind of looks around. They analyze the, the vibe, the lines, the craft beer, and they make the split decision whether they want to go or not. It's really, you do a lot of mental, um, a lot of calculus when you first walk into a bar the first time, deciding whether you want to, to stay in or not. Actually, fun fact, that's why Irish bars are always built. Like, as soon as you walk in, you see the bartender straight ahead. It's like a perpendicular because mm. you can be greeted as soon as you enter to feel welcome. Welcome it's to Mo's. Greeted. Yeah, if you're welcome, you feel it, you, you get a nice like eye contact with the bartender, you're more likely to sit down and have a beer. That's really like, welcome to Patty's. Or welcome to Olazavas, because John Lazavath always wanted to open up an Irish pub. The former oh, Lazavath? That's co- amazing. co-host go of, this, of this show. He, he does have a improv theater in Tampa now called the Commodore. And so he's leasing a place in Ebor for improv where you can learn and do. So if you're anywhere near Tampa, go to the Commodore and you can see my buddy John and his group, his troop 
a uh, Lisa Theater. So you can go check out some good improv from a former MFF co-host for 100 episodes. The first yeah, 100. he was there from the beginning. Yeah. So He's yeah, man, OG. like th this movie cocktail, right? It's as a former bouncer and as someone who spent many years of his life standing at a door frame and just headlocking people. It's it's really I don't it's such like a fantasy land. And and you know, you know, it's interesting too. the original book, you know, the, the author talked about it. He, he, he just kind of said like, like the guy who wrote the script too. He's just sort of the guy. Yeah, the guy who wrote the script. He's just he wrote it as more of a an older dude who's been bartending for 10 years and he was all bright eyed and bushy tailed, but that's 10 years later. And he's like, Oh crap. But like, that's yeah. In, in, a, in a blink of an eye, 10 years goes by. Yeah. And, and listen, he wrote that like 10, a blink of an eye. And you know, they both bought the right to the script. They, they, they wanted a younger person. He, and he's like, all right, whatever, man. Like I was a younger person when I bartended, like, so I could switch it to a younger person. But then you watch this movie and it's, this movie's weird, Eric, cause it's three movies. It's, Tom it's Cruise. three acts. Yeah, there's literally it, three acts in this movie. It's like a play. Yeah. <laughs> and he, and he's like, "Listen, I'm gonna go get a job." And everyone's like, "No." He's like, "I, I can tell you what's wrong on that ad." And they're like, "No." Nah. And he's like, "I'm gonna go to school." And he's like, "Nah." And, he's, and he starts bartending. And he's like, "Nah." And then he goes to Jamaica and he meets a girl and he's like, "Nah." And then he meets a rich lady, and she uses him as like nah. a, a play toy. And he goes, "Nah." Uh, and then he goes to meet up with his buddy and his buddy's like, "Nah." And then eventually he starts a bar with his pregnant girlfriend who ran away from her family in a violent encounter. And now they have to stay up late every night and balance books and clean the floors of a, of a bar. They're going to become well, vampires. He's franchising. He's franchising it. <laughs> he's got to hire some good people that he can yeah. just get into management. <laughs> That's what you have kids for. You have kids for so they can work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just get them going. Get them the going. Clean those glasses. But it's, <laughs> it's a weird movie, man. And, and I, you know, I've had to watch every single Tom Cruise movie three times since 2018. <laughs> So I've had to go through. Well, he wasn't running. He didn't do any running. Yeah, well, he, he did running. on the beach. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and, and he the beach when his, someone was. Yeah. And he runs to his class in the beginning. Yep. I okay. scanned every inch of his movie. And Just, at the bus, at the bus too, when he was trying to catch it. All right. So many people miss like there's, there's every Tom Cruise run. I have the only definitive one. I'm just, I'm just letting everyone know, but it, I've watched it in like a cocktail, is such an outlier, man, because it's, he learned from it. Like, like you said, it's his lowest tomato meter rated film. <laughs> But you could We're see the, Cruz's worst movie right now. But you could see, all, but that's what's great, right? Like that's why we can talk about it because I think he learned a lot from this movie. He made it like the dancing, like he never does that again. He's never made him like when I saw like, when he was jumping on Oprah's couch, I was, mm. and then you watch him dance in this movie, you're like, oh, he's just like he's got this energy, and it like it was so exuberant in this movie. Yeah, and and so you see that in him, but you never see that again. Like this is not. Well, he Jerry Maguire, he did. did. But what was the dancing he did in that? No, the exuberant nature, oh. like the screaming and the over the top but reaction. He had, he had Cameron Crowe, and like ten years after that, like he had, True. like he, and I think that's probably his best performance because he puts everything together in it. Like he's a great romantic lead. He's funny. He's 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 rakish. Like he's not. You just see him in the Mummy. He's like, oh, Tom Cruise is Lothario in this movie, and you're like, get away. But in Jerry Maguire, he's like a good like. Everything comes together for him and Jerry Maguire, but I don't think all that happens without the lessons you learn from cocktail. Maybe, you, you know, I was just uh, traveling for work. So I was away for a while and I was, I was catching up on movies and I, uh, I saw cocktail on, on Hulu and I'm like, okay, let's check this out. This looks interesting. I, Cause I, I don't know anything. I didn't remember it at all. So I start watching it and I, I thought this would be a perfect one for us to discuss because you go in expecting a flashy movie about Tom Cruise grinning cocktail and all these bar tricks. And then you were like, wow, this is kind of dark. And this has got a, this is a lot of themes in this movie. I mean, there's like, you know, be careful about who you select as your mentor, because that says a lot about who you are, you know, be, be careful on whose advice you're taking and, and who you emulate <laughs> because this mentor, he uh, brings out the best in them and he brings out the worst in them. There's also like, he was all thrust, no vector, you know, like, you know, have a plan, you know, you can't just go out, you know, what do you want to do? You can't just want to do everything. Right. There's also other themes too. in here, like people who partly loathe their career. I think, you know, he didn't like, you could tell some sadness when he was in Jamaica, like the repetitive acts aspect of it. There's just, there's so many different things going on as well. And, you know, another thing that struck me in this movie is be careful about you, what you aim for too it's like they were just aiming to get wealthy yeah and just bad decision after bad decision after bad decision you know just shooting to be wealthy 
So it's um, I know it struck me is I'm I'm not saying it was the best movie ever. I I just thought there were a lot of deeper undertones that they tried to get across, or or at least that came out in the movie. And that's why I think it was so low rated, is that people went in thinking about it was one thing, but it was a totally different thing. And then they tried to make it happy at the end. <laughs> Dude, you know, I, I hadn't watched this movie for years. The I, first time I watched this movie was 2018 when I did my first watch. And I thought it was just the bottle flipping movie where you're, like the Beach Boys sing Kokomo. Like I didn't, like I, I thought it was just the flighty little thing. And then I'm watching it and I see what happens to Coughlin. And then just the, the, this. That was too on the nose, man. That was yeah. too, like, it, like was too much. You know, you see what happens with him. And then like the, with Elizabeth's shoe and the violent encounter with the family. And you're like, and then also the it hurts it's three movies like it, so mm -hmm. many movies have the three act structure but they transition well into each other this one's like peace out new york we're in jamaica and it's like peace out jamaica we're in new york like they don't transition like there's no it's like deer hunter it's like or like <laughs> yeah. one of those movies where it's like vietnam then back home yeah. and <laughs> and you're just kind of like wait wait and then yeah it's not what people are expecting also dude this came after top gun and what uh, um the uh, the color of money so like, you know, Oscar nominated movies and like Top Gun was a gigantic blockbuster. And then you go watch Cocktail and you're kind of like, what? Like I've seen him be a pilot. I've seen him be, you know, a pool hustler. Now he's just hanging out with this dude and, you know, drinking eggs and tomato juice and yeah. beer. And it was a, it was the third movie in a row where, where he was like this young hotshot guy. And then he gets mentored by, you know, your older sage leaders or people. Color of Money, Paul Newman, you know, he was kind of cool, but kind of sleazy. You know, it was, you know, Color of Money is not an easy movie to watch. Paul oh. Newman, it was so good in that, but it was just kind of like yucky. And that's the best description I have but of that's Color what it, of Money. That's it was, what it should be because they're going into I know. pool halls, right? And I they're know. They're going into like, they're going into the pool halls to hustle money. And like, so it should, yeah. you should feel, It was yucky. It, yeah. It, it was, it was authentic. And I don't, it just was it was too authentic to, to <laughs> I couldn't really enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, but, and then Top Gun, obviously he's young, he's brash. You got the, uh, the admirals always yelling and the captains always yelling at him and, and teaching him. Yeah. You know? And the music but, and the death and ice man. And it's just all, you know, Tony mm -hmm. Scott, man, his style is beautiful. And then you get, and then you get <laughs> cocktail cocktail with yeah. Kaufman. <laughs> but they, they originally wanted Robin Williams for that role, yeah. by the way. Fun fact. That would have been incredible. But I think Coughlin's perfect, though, because he's, like, you know, that scene where he's like, you know, drink or leave and like drink or quit or like, you know, beers for breakfast. And he's a pusher and he just wants someone to kind of go down with him. But then he takes Gina Gershon and then he goes and shows up to Jamaica. And he's just a he's just a, a sad kind of lech who. Uh, and also to his bar, right? He, he made a, this. He had a good lines, though. He had a yeah. lot of good lines well, in this movie. Yeah, he's like he just. But I feel like most. Yeah, he's just so practiced, though. Like all of his lines that he's spitting out, and I think he does the best of his abilities. But then he's he makes he he's been bartending for all these years. But then he opens up his own business, puts too much money into it, and then he'll never make money. But but that's the problem. He's always making fun of Tom Cruise for having the the manuals about bartending and about studying it, and then what he does in. He just goes, uh, he wants the biggest, the best in Manhattan. He wants to be the richest. Instead of saying, okay, what, where is the need in the city that we can fill and make a smart business case for that? He just wanted to be the best, regardless mm -hmm. of, of what anyone else needed. And that's the biggest like fault with starting a bar is you got to find the need in that community for that particular bar so he did what he wanted versus what was business sound and that's why i kind of like the ending because tom cruise found something that was popular it was homey like bars in new york are extension of your house because you don't really spend a lot of time in your tiny little apartment You're usually out at restaurants and things so that was that was really interesting to me there's some cool new york pubs man i found or some a bottle of writer's tears that they brought back from ireland just sitting on a shelf there one time that was lovely I was, I, went, I went to irish pub and like yeah yeah there's some, there's a lot of bars though, but you're right though. They have to fill the need. They have to have character, you know, and there has to be a bar for every different type of person. So like, yeah. you saw, you saw the balls bars I worked at. They were very, for a very specific clientele, but they filled the <laughs> need for a lot of people, you know, and they're, they, yeah. they, they were big for a while. Uh, so I, I think you can't just open a bar and expect to succeed. You have to think about the area and think about where you are and the traffic and can people pull in here? Can people walk here? Is there not alley? Is there a popular bar nearby? Like there's way too many things to think about. 
he didn't think about any of that. He just he just wanted I'm going to go big. Yeah. 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 It's all it was very empty. I got to ask you when you were bouncing, did anyone stand up and recite poetry at your bar? Oh, dude. So, all right, I worked at Big Daddy's. <laughs> <laughs> and like it, it was crazy music i mean like you know, playboy was like we're the best bar in america at one point and which wow. i don't know if that's a great advertisement you know back in the early 2000s but it you know, we, we had like my chemical romance play there before they were big in front of like 30 people we had some big names 30 seconds on mars yeah like, you had offspring <laughs> yeah, yeah like big names and like the ataris and and a lot of hardcore bands and like you know we were ha- we were a pretty cool spot there for a while and but yeah, no one no one did poetry like that. Was, you know, Jared Leto punching sideburns, sideburns right in the face, this, ever, yeah. this clocking sideburns. Never dance weird in front of. So so no so no one did any poetry at your bar is what you're saying. No man, I mean the closest it came was probably the Brewskis, but it's... so there there was. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so in the, in cocktail for for the listeners, uh, there's a couple times when Tom Cruise got up and had to recite poetry off the cuff about being a bartender. And there's a yuppie guy who gave this really ridiculous yuppie um, oh, 80s, yeah. you know, materialistic poem. So I'm like thinking about the times when I would come in and hang out with Mark at, at Big Daddy's and, and my friends. And I wrote a poem. I, I can't remember the last time I've, I've written a poem, but I spent a whopping five minutes on this. I mean, you ready for this? Yeah, let's hear it. Okay. All right. There once was a bar called Big Daddy's in Tallahassee. Sticky floors, cheap beer, and Jägermeister splashing. (laughs) Back when Coors Light reigned supreme, good whiskey was a pipe dream. Patrons airborne like DJ Jazzy Jeff in the 90s. (laughs) Great bands like My Chemical Romance and the Brewskis. Attempts to recite poetry would be booed mercilessly. But actually, Mark, you would throw people out. All the time. Yeah. So I wasn't like you would literally air people would go airborne being thrown up by you and Kahuna. I wasn't. So we weren't violent bartenders. Like we weren't the club bartenders. So we were a bar. So like it was mostly most of the time it was just two of us. And what I realized er, very early on was like when a fight breaks out, you got to squash it fast. And in one time. So all right, the reason why you would chuck people out is is because one time I tried to throw this person out, but they latched onto the door. So I had them around the waist and they were just squeezing onto the door and I couldn't get them out of the stupid <laughs> bar and people were just laughing. And I tried to turn them around. They put their feet up. So eventually I just dropped, like dropped them. And I put them in like a bear hug. And then I tried to, and then I walked them out backwards, but they were still trying to hook their foot on there. So like, I would just kind of be like, clear room and like clear, you know, clear it. And then I would just kind of do a running push outside the door. I didn't see anybody out there. I didn't think it through too much, but that got them out quick. And so that was like, it was the easiest way to throw people out. And then I would walk out and take their band off and tell them to leave. But yeah, that was the, the bouncing way. But I try not to rough people up too much. Like if they were cool about it, you just put them in a headlock and you walk them out. Or you just go, hey man, out. And then that's fine. But you just gotta like, I'm telling you, man, as a bouncer, you can't let it, because if they bump into somebody, they're going to be mad. Like the t- first time I hurt my back as a bouncer, there's a guy who got into a fight with one of our regulars. And I, th- the guy started it. So I picked up the guy. But then the regular went and punched him in the gut while I was carrying the guy out. And then the guy lurched forward. And so did I. And my back popped. And I was so mad at that regular. <laughs> but it's <laughs> come on. Yeah, it, it, it's you got to squash it fast. Because if if one person gets it, then another person gets pushed and the guy gets pushed. And they're, you know, like a girl gets pushed and then she hits somebody. And it like, escalates. Yeah. So you just got to like squash it fast. But I never hurt anybody. Like sometimes if they're really big and I knew I couldn't take them, I would just headlock them and lay on them until the cops came. Because I, I, I knew some jujitsu and like I, I could like hold them down. So like that was like just don't get up you know get get him in a head and arm and just lay on him till the cops come so like i didn't want to hurt anybody like i didn't want anybody hurting them i didn't want them hurting anybody but yeah that was but you know you know th- oh, so there's a line in this movie where he goes days get shorter and shorter nights longer and longer before you know it your life is just one long night with a few comatose daylight hours and it's true man it's like, true 100 bar, bar closes at two you're out at three you're kind of jacked up man like you're kind of you know, like, you know, hey guys, let's go have a few beers, you know? So we go out some beers yeah. and go to someone's house. And by the time you get home at 6 a.m. And then you just sleep through the day, you wake up and then you probably go back to work. And that's like the cycle that you live. And it's because you don't want to immediately just go home. Like you, just, you want to go kick it with your friends, but then it's like the same thing every night. Every right. Night, you get, every you night, get trapped every in that, that cycle. And we're, we're not, we're not insulting the profession by any stretch of the imagination. If you like that lifestyle, it's cool, but it, it does tend to to get you into a certain cycle. Yeah. And, and you know, w- and like one thing I thought, great, but it's yeah, 
It, uh, and, you know, people could enjoy their jobs, man. But, and, you know, maybe if they had discipline, like when I worked on film sets, I learned discipline with my, 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 my food and my sleep. After every wrap, I went home and slept, ate very healthy food. And like people who went out and partied, their bodies would be wrecked at the end of the shoot because they never slept and they're just exhausted and they can't keep up. So I learned to take care of my body. I was younger when I was bouncing, you know, like when I went back in grad school, I went immediately home and went to sleep. I didn't, I didn't mess around with, with anything after that. So it's, it's, you know, when I was younger, you go out and you party and like you feel invincible, but then, you know, by the time you're 24, 25, and you're like, wait a second, <laughs> uh, the Brucey's isn't going to get famous. So it's, uh, it's, and it was a band I was in, but it, uh, you, you sort of, but he's right though. Like you, the daylight hours become less, the night gets longer, but all you're basically doing is sitting at a bar. You have great conversations though, and you hang out with cool people and, and you have some really neat moments, but it's like a commuter thing. Like people come and go. So you get new people coming to the bar, you become friends with them and you get new people coming to the bar. It's like, you, once you've seen enough of them go, you're kind of over it. So that's when I kind of left for the first time to, to move on. But yeah, it's gotcha. You know, one thing they got right was restaurants and bars. They throw you right into the action. Mm -hmm. I remember like when I, I did some bar backing and busing at a fine dining Italian restaurant in Ybor in Tampa one summer. And I grew up a lot that summer. <laughs> so everything, <laughs> but what, they restaurants they throw you right in to see if you can sink or swim or not that that was pretty normal like he went in there not knowing all the drinks but it's it's one thing to not know the drinks the other one how quickly can you learn you know how how do you adapt to the the situation so i'm like okay that is totally true in yeah. restaurants just dive right into the the situation and there's there's a couple of things I liked. I remember at the bar when he was first learning how to be a bartender and everyone's throwing drink orders after him and drink orders. And he's like, had no idea what was going on, but it was a stressful scene because you had like people yelling at him from every direction. And I, I liked it because, you know, with servers, their, their tips depend on how fast you could turn this out. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of distress and stressed out people. I mean, it, it is true, but also I, I like it created a little suspense and action. You know, I, I like mundane moments like ordering drinks that they turn them into uh, an, like an action sequence. And I really enjoy how movies can can do that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Any other movies and, and scenes that stick out to you where it could be a mundane moment, but they make it interesting and a couple of options. Like I remember Asteroid City when they played the memorization game and they just kept going around the circle. Oh, They're movie. playing a game, but it was a good scene and it really kept my attention. Oh, or um, everybody wants some when they're on the phone together, you know, with, for the first time, like li li when you can make an, a mundane um, scene interesting, I think is when you're a great filmmaker. Oh, I just watched a movie called Full Time. It's a, a beautiful French film. And it, this, this woman catching a cab was one of the most stressful things <laughs> or renting a car was one of the most stressful things I've ever seen. So, yeah, I mean, I think but that's a testament to music, editing, directing the setup and. Sure. And listen, they do throw you into that world really well. But I mean, if you think about the world of cooking and chefing and prepping, like those hours are crazy long, too. So I think people don't realize the amount of stress that goes on with all of that. So, yeah, toss him in there. He doesn't know the drinks. The main thing is he didn't quit. <laughs> the main thing is, yeah. you know, he lost his That's temper it. a few times, but that showed them that he's not going to be like a pushover. He he kept his composure. He didn't crawl into a, like a, a fetal position and just lay there. He he made it through the night, and that that happened to me my first night bouncing. Like it, I did a terrible job. The only thing that saved yeah. me is that some guy went after my boss, and I just picked up the guy because that's when I weighed two fifty. I just like picked up on the air like he was nothing, and I walked him out. So the boss was like, "Yeah, you, you didn't really do great tonight, but you did that, so you can come back again." I was like, oh, "Okay, cool." <laughs> and then I picked it up, and you see the flashes later, of yeah. potential. Yeah, but yeah, I just I just scooped a guy up in front of him, and he's like, "Oh, okay, like this <laughs> this guy's helpful." <laughs> So yeah, we, we, uh, we can train this one. <laughs> yeah, because I no one told me no one told me what to do. And so you know, I, I probably should have just but I, I just I probably should have sat there and thought like, OK, what do I do? Uh, but, you know, I was young, so I didn't really think about it. You, you know, another great scene was I just watched rewatch Office Space for the for the first time in like 20 years. And um, the, remember the scene in the beginning when he's just in traffic and he's yeah. inching along, you know, he's listening to the music, he's stressed out. And a scene in traffic was interesting. That was another example of, of like a fun storytelling. Because everyone feels that. Like everyone knows yeah. what it's like to sit in traffic. And I mean, shoot, man, you live in Miami. I live in Atlanta. We, we know traffic. So it's 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 we sit in traffic. And sometimes you're like, oh, man, like sometimes my, my so I leave an hour and a half for work. Like some days I'll get there in an hour. Right. Some days it'll take me two hours. 
to get to work. Like it's just, and, and you're just not moving at all and you're stressed out and yeah, you just feel it. The, the mundane drive, I think. So it's, but you know, I kind of do it to myself. There's another route I could go with a bunch of different turns and areas, but it's like you're gambling. It's like you can make it there quicker, but also it could be a lot slower. So I just choose to mm -hmm. sit on the highway because I just know that it won't be as stressful. So I've taken the least stressful route the older I get. I don't want to freewheel all over the place on peach. Yeah, every you don't peach be tree. fried by the time you get to work. <laughs> yeah, and every peach tree in the planet. I don't want to do that. But it's listen, this movie, there's a reason why it's it's beloved, right? There's a reason why it was on cable. Like, I remember this movie being on cable all the time. And I, like I said, I never watched it, but you always knew I always knew cocktail was a thing, right? And I never mm -hmm. knew cocktail was as reviled <laughs> as it was, uh, but like people watch it. People watch. It's true. That people watched it, and 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 the reason is there's like no, like, there's really he's never down long, <laughs> and so yeah, like sure Coughlin kills himself at the end, but then he gets a bar three minutes later. Like he reads mm -hmm. a letter and he's like, oh, okay, all's good with the world. And I got my girlfriend. It's like nothing's dwelled on too long in this movie. Yeah, I was googling. Um best bartenders in film before this episode just because i'm like i couldn't remember any like i remember uh deadpool had the bartender i think probably my favorite bartender of all time was the guy from uh forgetting sarah marshall the guy that knew the, the state fish of hawaii and you put up with jason siegel drunk and complaining all the time he's <laughs> my favorite one but all the lists had flanagan young flanagan from cocktail but it only had nine percent so it's like the best bartenders in film. He's on every list, but the movie itself is 9% of critic score and only 50% of audience score. So it's like everyone bagged on it, but whatever, it's still burned into the, the psyche of, of pop culture. This Tom Cruise is a bartender. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Like, it's not, you can't watch this movie and be like, this is an entire movie because he doesn't learn really many lessons. Everything sort of comes together for him. And it, it does feel like the script kind of is like a seesaw. It goes into like the original screenplay that was based on more of a mature bartender. Then it goes to Kokomo and then it goes to that and then it goes to something else. So it, it's it seesaws around a little bit. But I, I like I said, man, like the, you could put this movie like now if this movie was on cable, you know exactly what scene it is. You know, the dude's about to fall down the subway steps. You know, he's about to fall asleep. Yeah, he would class. have been seriously yeah. injured oh, gosh, if he yeah. fell down and, Conquer. And like, you know, a speech is about to come. You know, he's going to, you know, fist fights coming up. You know, that weird scene with Gina Gershon where Tom Cruise just tickled her as much as possible. And then she fell off the bed. Yeah, but it, that was a that was a fun scene. I mean, they, they had fun filming that. And like and Gina Gershon's been around forever, man. She's the But it's I love it. She's still crushing it. She was in Thanksgiving. I like that movie. But yeah, it's 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 so low stakes cocktail. I know at the end, yeah, the guy kills right. himself, but yeah. He's Coughlin's a, a a butthole anyway, so like he's he's just gonna he, he's such a coward, and and but then see the thing is they don't dwell on it. He just reads the letter. He's like, oh okay, cool, Coughlin's law, like just put him in the dirt, blah blah blah, and then he goes and gets his girlfriend back. And then he has a successful bar, so it's it's it, it, and it leaves on an upper. It doesn't leave him as like a forty year old bartender with a gut and receding mm -hmm. hair, and just looking miserable. Well, you know, Jason Bateman from Extraction comes in and just complains the entire time. But it's, it, yeah, it, it, you, it leaves you on a high. <laughs> Jason Bateman? Yeah, remember, you know, Extraction, Ben Affleck's the bartender. He just gives the worst advice ever. Like, that's a that's more of a bar to me. But it, oh, right. it, it um, no, I just think it, it's in and out. And, and that's, but that's what makes it successful. I, I think, I think sometimes you can look at a movie and be like, this is not the sum of all its parts. But. You can still enjoy it if that may, like yeah uh, can i ask you a question so I, you mentioned the seesawing the different acts and, and the different parts of it like what other movies are like this where they appear glossy and fun but they take a, a sharp turn like i i'm thinking of like office space where it starts a hitch job and then it turns into a heist or hot hot fuzz it went from police to horror satire or maybe like the prestige you think it's about musicians and it was like a weird sci-fi twist what kind of movies do you, other ones do you think about, about taking this like very interesting turn, you know, when you get into the movie and is that fair for oh, the, the audience? You know, that that's really interesting because I think these are mostly movies that become cult classics. Like look at death to smoochie with Edward Norton. I went into that with Robin Williams. I'm like, Oh man, it's Edward Norton and Robin Williams. Edward Norton's amazing. But then I watched it and it's the most like 
uh, profane and mean spirited movie that I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. But then it, when I, years later, I think about it. I'm like, I kind of laugh or you think about Heather's, right? You think that's going to be this fun movie about like high schoolers. And then it takes a wild turn. Shaun of the dead gets really emotional. Uh, th there's mm -hmm. what, what, let's see, like America, like burn after reading. Have you seen burn after reading? No, it's a Coen's brother movie with Brad Pitt and George Clooney, but it takes some turns, man. And it's very funny. But there's also moments in it where you go, oh, my gosh, or like Super by by James Gunn or Slither. I never thought those two movies would be as violent and gnarly as they were because I thought they were just going to be fun films. So, yeah, it, uh, but you know what, though? I don't think it's like I don't think marketing wants to show that, though. Like If you have a movie like Death the Smoochie and you want if I'm a marketer and I see <laughs> Death the Smoochie, I'm like, oh, crap. Like, how do I communicate yeah. about this? Like, how do I like, get people in the seats? Like, <laughs> I, I I don't know what to do. So I would just it's it's funny. It's a funny movie. Like who, who cares? it's funny. If I'm if I'm doing like Jojo Rabbit, man, that movie, like that movie takes some some people get hung and die. Like it gets bleak in that movie. But you're not going to show that in a trailer. So it's well, wasn't that that's another one that was based on a book though too. Yeah, that's. I mean, I guess if you've read it, but if you haven't, and you're like, oh hey, Taika Waititi, and he's playing Hitler, and and it looks funny, and then all of a sudden someone's hanging from the ground, you see their shoes. So it's, it, it, but I think a lot of these movies are not met with well. And I mean, mm -hmm. the, by audiences that that's, I, I wish I could come up with a better example, but I think, you know, what's like get out, right. It's an incredible movie. It originally had a very bleak ending, but then he made it into a more positive ending and it made a ton, ton more money. Yeah. You, you look at the Marvel movies, they just follow such a formula and then they end happy. Most of them. So you're like, Oh, okay, mm -hmm. cool. It's like, if, if you left one of these like infinity war left, but the, everyone knew there's a part two coming. If you just left on the biggest downer, it, it it doesn't work. And I think this movie needed that positive ending, but it it also there's what what is the message of cocktail? I don't know. I don't know how to, I, I don't fall for a, a bartender in Jamaica. I don't know. Like, <laughs> like just or uh be careful about who your mentors are. I I, I don't think it has it's all over the place. Yeah. There's so many different messages. I mean, it could be follow your dreams like the whole cocktail and dreams, but then like, he didn't even have the right dream. He pivoted to something he was able to do well. And that was attainable. Yeah. But yeah. there is, I can't summarize this. It's basically because there's three different acts too. I mean, it's like a whirlwind romance, but that doesn't happen until halfway through the movie. He? You, you can't summarize this movie cleanly. And if you try, you're only telling a partial story. And he and he like slams her in the water during that one scene. They were wrestling. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious, though. Like, I mean, that's like like my wife tries to take me out all the time. That seems like a very Tom, <laughs> that seems very Tom Cruise, though, right? Like, I don't think he I don't think he has a three setting. Like, I don't think he could tussle in the water. I think oh, if he's you, going all the way. If you start tussling with him, he's going to single leg you and slam you on a rock like he doesn't have. And I'm like, oh, man, my bad. I just lose it. Like, he doesn't have a. Like, does that like does that make sense like he's yeah he's he, the guy if you're if you're doing jujitsu and you're rolling he just takes it too far and yeah like, yo dude yo yo we're at 60 percent right now <laughs> you, you just, just can't do it you just snap my arm tom cruise well that was my 30 that was my 30 like what what's your 100 he's like it's tornado what like you don't want to see it but yeah he's when he slammed her in the water <laughs> I was like, th this is he did a leg sweep. Like this... it was a, it was like like put your leg behind her heel and then do like a hip thrust. If they showed her back after that, it would just be red. But this is the, the closest I think we've come to the exuberance of Tom Cruise, who he actually is, like with the slamming her in the water. Because I bet you they were just like, hey, go in the water and have fun. And then he just belly just <laughs> slams her. And then her like, hey, Tom Cruise, just dance. And like, that's his dancing. And everyone's like, oh, my gosh. Like, I think that's, I think that's him. And he's had to rein it in for, for things. Like, I don't think he can be as pumped up in movies. Cause then people are like, this doesn't work too well. So I, I mean, but if you, let's, let's look at it. So cocktail after cocktail, he went, and he pivoted he, after cocktail. He was like, I need to go to rain man and born on the 4th of July. I need to do the complete opposite of what I've been doing. Uh, I'm still a hot shot, but I have to take care of my brother and Oscar winner. And then born on the 4th of July, I'm going to work with Oliver Stone. It's true to life story. I'm going to get an Oscar nomination. I'm going to be super serious. And then you, I, I love it too. But then he goes back. To, You're right. He yeah. did take a serious turn after cocktail. Because that's what most people do. 
And then like people were kind of like, yeah, this is great. But then he went and did the Days of Thunder and everyone's like, well, this is him being a hot shot again. And then he did Far and Away and he has the Irish accent and everyone went, nah. And then he went back to his bread and butter, man. He went back to like a few good men. He went to the firm. He's, he's basically a variation of Tom Cruise in that. Then he goes unhinged for Vampire. Like he's gnarly in Interview with the Vampire. But then, you know, I, you know what I love about him, man? He, he knows that. And then he does Mission Impossible and Jerry Maguire, two very good mm-hmm. ones. He jumps into Eyes Wide Shut, which he spent a year with Stanley Kubrick, which and that's, that's, that movie features his best walking, by the way. His best sitting is in Collateral. Just letting everyone know. Well, didn't they do 80 scenes of him walking through yeah. the door? Yeah, that's what Kubrick on did. Eyes Wide Shut? Yeah, that's what Kubrick would make people do 100 some takes. So when you signed up on a Kubrick movie, you were going to be there for eight years. So it's, I think he, you know, it's cool though. I think he just accepted it. Like he and Nicole Kidman were like, we signed up for a Kubrick movie. So we were there for a year. And he said he learned a lot, but like, but then he went to Magnolia. killed their marriage too, wasn't it? Yeah, because it was just gnarly. And then he, he goes and does Magnolia, gets another Oscar nomination. And then he does like Mission Impossible 2, which was a lot of fun, made bank. Then he did Vanilla Sky, which missed. So then he's like, okay, I'm going to go do my, like he, he knows how to like stay steady, like through his career. If he has a, a, a dud, he learns from it and does something else. Like he never, he never, it's like a YouTube algorithm. If you have a couple of hits, if you have some duds, man. So I work for a company. Who, who really has to watch the algorithm. And if they have a couple dud episodes, they need to go back to their bread and butter and get 5 million views to put them back up in the algorithm. You can't, oh, you yeah. can't have three low algorithms. And you, you know all that. And so I yeah. think Tom Cruise has figured out the algorithm for his career. Because I think after Mummy, I think after Jack Reacher never go back, the Mummy and American Made, he's like, we're not doing this again. So since then, he's on Fallout, Maverick, and Dead Reckoning. <laughs> he's like, I need, to, I need to go back to my bread and butter. So he, he's like the, the human algorithm of keeping in. And I, but I think like cocktail though, he, he, he seems to learn from all these movies. Like he's just, he's like the, he's like AI, but human. Like he just absorbs everything and learns. And so he, I'm telling you, man, like aside from Jerry Maguire, we haven't seen this Tom Cruise in other movies. No, we haven't. That's that's a good observation. I got a few other questions for you. I, w- I want to run this by you real Wait. quick. Some things I thought about. Also, he's never been a normal guy. The la- like so he I think he took a break from being like a, a like a like a broke dude. Like so he took like far and away, but that's more of like an epic and he's a bare knuckle boxer. So I think he wasn't like a regular dude again until I totally missed far and away. Do you want to review that one in a future episode? Yeah, he has an Irish accent. He does a lot of running. I've never, I've never seen it. And Nicole Kimmons in it. I, I don't think he was a regular dude until where is it? War of the Worlds. And he's just like a, a loser dad. Oh, he got swept up yeah. into it. The, the action. And But then he starts running and then like he outruns everybody. But that's like he's kind of like a, a bum dad. And then he goes back to being Tom Cruise again. Yeah, and then maybe American made. He's just a guy, but then he's drug run. So yeah, he's only been like a dude, a regular dude in a couple movies, and this is one of them because he's not a regular dude. But why well, he was a dude in Color of Money, which is a dude in a pool hall. Yeah, that's true. But he had he had the hustle though, right? Like he he had like, something special. Like yeah, he had a game like this one. He keeps failing at stuff. <laughs> just like he he doesn't figure it out until he gets a wife's his wife's money to open up a bar. So what's like the worst possible mo- movie he could do? Would, would it be like he starts a, like a software company? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like an entrepreneur. Starts a soft- what's the worst thing he could possibly do? Just and he goes around selling it. I don't know. Like just the worst thing he could do. The worst. Thing. The opposite of the algorithm. If the algorithm broke. What? what 180. Mo- so he wants to he wants to break the algorithm and like in a, in a yeah. bad way or w- 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 like like what's the most mundane movie like court stenographer or uh oh, man some company oh, okay not like not paparazzi he goes he joins the the newest barbershop movie i don't know like what we like he did rock of ages ever. but i admire him for that because he tries so hard in it which one was that one the one where it, it's a musical based on the stage play and he plays stacy jacks a rocker and he's I don't know if it works, but he is so committed in it that you just go, okay, okay, Tom, like you, you earn this one. You put everything, you put every molecule, molecule of your being into this movie. But I, I think, okay, to break, to break the algorithm, to break the algorithm. Has he done any cartoons where he's just voice in the like, animated like features? Like Sausage Party? 
No, I don't, I don't think he's done too many animated movies. Okay. To break the algorithm. Like a Disney movie voiceover. <laughs> he would be, I think he'd be quite charming. Okay. He would have to be like a, like the, the game plan to the football movie, but Tom Cruise. Oh, like he gets, he's a lawyer. He gets a DUI. He has to find. No, he's a football player. Coaching sports. Yeah, he's a football player. And now? Yeah, now. And he learns he has seven illegitimate, not illegitimate, <laughs> he has seven children from seven different women. And they all meet and they all decide to go on vacation and leave the seven children with him. And then oh. he also gets injured during this time. So then he has to like deal with poop and pee and like basically the pacifier too. a road trip like a, a road trip movie and then, and then he just has to go like or a christmas special stop i gotta clean up this butt like yeah stop peeing on me stop you know like come back here nick like he's just he's just that guy but he has to play like whoa that's it <laughs> we'll break the tom cruise algorithm it's like it's like wild hogs but like wild dads and he's a football player and he learns he has seven children. And then he has to like, I have to learn how to take care of these kids. And then he has to take care of them. Tom Cruise is the pacifier too. <laughs> Vin Diesel gets fired from the pacifier yeah, franchise. Yeah. They bring in Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, so that's... Watching these kids as a nanny. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think he could do it. Like, ah! like, he just couldn't do it. It wouldn't work. Okay. That, that was a fun one. I, I got a couple of questions for you. There's, there's some scenes where there's a lot of drunk people in this movie, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you were a director and you were providing tips, how would you have your actors act drunk? Like, would you actually give them a beer to loosen them up? Or would you uh, just have them pretend and, and have it act? I wouldn't hire extras, first and foremost. So if I was doing a bar scene and I was doing an a packed bar scene, I would... Okay, so where where, where is the, to give me a place, like, uh, a party, a party. So it's a drunk party. Yeah, and you've got drunk actors. Okay, drunk on screen. Mm -hmm. So you have so you're in a party. You're at a house. I, I'm assuming, right? Is it a house? Yeah, house party. House party. Bunch of drunk people. So I would go out and hire SAG actors for everybody. It would be very expensive, but I would cut stuff out of the budget in other places because extras are great. It, maybe if you're in LA, if you're in England, if you're in New York, you could maybe find some good ones. But let's say we're shooting in like a right to work state and we don't really have a strong batch of like SAG extras. I would go mm -hmm. and find SAG extras. Like I would get featured extras who act and I would audition all of them for their drunk acting. What about your main star though? Like your main characters? Like they're, they're, they're slammed. They're, they're saying dumb stuff. Like there's a scene in cocktail where Coughlin and, and Flanagan are walking down the street after uh, they close and they're drunk and, you know, having a nightcap. I think the best drunk acting is just pretend like you're not drunk, but you are drunk. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't want like, uh, I'm just too drunk. Like you gotta, you know, everyone's been drunk. Yeah, let's try not in order to be a good drunk. You have to act as if you're not drunk. Is yeah. that what you're saying? But you really that's are drunk. Smart. Like, that's what I would say because, listen, you're drunk, but you're not trying to be drunk. But you're clearly, <laughs> but like the words are coming out of your mouth incorrectly because you're drunk. Like you're not doing it like, you're just, you're just drunk. I'm like, you're not going to talk right. <laughs> you're not going to walk right. But you're not, so you're not flanging all over the place. You're not bumping into walls. Like you've been drunk would before. You have your would you have your actor actually take a shot just to loosen them up a little bit? No, because these no? days are so long, they would get tired. Like if you're if you're acting drunk and you have a 12 hour day and you're giving them shots, like I wouldn't I wouldn't give a shot. I would hire actors that could do it. I would and I would I, that would be an expensive day for me, but I would have to cut it from other places in the budget because I would have to hire if I had drunk extras, I would have to hire featured drunk extras because it's hard. And like, you know, untrained extras, they're great. Or, or background actors as they're called background talent you know they aren't trained so once the cameras go on they, they forget how to walk i'd be on sets i'm like hey y'all like that's not how you walk like let's 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 walk like just walk with me okay that's that's how we do it so when you know, action do that and then their arms go stiff and then they kind of do this weird walk you're like hey you're not you're not frankenstein um you're frank like so just walk like you like it's so people would i would i would that's what i would do and i i yeah, like, you know, Nick Cage is great in leaving Las Vegas. And, mm. um, but that's a different kind of drunk. Like, he's, you know, he's who's hilarious. Is you know, another Elizabeth Steve Buscemi. Movie. Yeah. Steve Buscemi and Wedding Singer is probably one of my favorite drunk people. 
yeah because he's a good <laughs> actor and he's like and yeah he's just like he's really good in that he's kind of squirrely in general so he <laughs> pulls it off so well yeah i just like he but see the way he plays it in wedding singer is so good too but yeah i would the movie i have in my head it would just be you know when you've had a few like beers in you and you're trying to not sound like you've had a few beers in you but then everyone mm-hmm. knows you've had a few beers in you but you're you, talking a little louder yeah and like you know That's... your mouth is a little drier you're you're fumbling a few words but you're still there like you can still go there you can probably still engage in yeah. things but you're a little slower <laughs> so it's cool, cool. yeah, Can yeah. We visit, remember the frank the tank scene in old school and <laughs> Will Ferrell was not acting drunk. It was just good writing. It was just funny writing the situation that they put him in to where he didn't have to act drunk. It was just a hilarious situation that he was in. So maybe it's a lot of it's the writing and, and what you have them do. And just, yeah, like, you know, like once it touches your lips, it's so good. And also to like that college scene, it's so heightened. And they did a lot of it through montage. And then eventually he's just running mm. naked. So you're not thinking about acting anymore. He's just running naked. So you... You, you you kind of hid the, the he didn't have to totally play drunk during that scene he's just doing things that a drunk person would yeah do okay I, I guess i would just tell my actors that everything's a little slower <laughs> just, <laughs> just everything's a little bit slower like i think uh, link letter does a great job of drinking uh, actors acting drunk or having stone conversations or you know, if you right. look at, he's made his money off stone conversation exactly and and i think he found a really good way around that like i think he figured out how to do it and make it seem organic so it's but i mean also people love half-baked and they're just acting stoned out of their gourd and they're idiots and so it, it's just it depends on the movie but the movie i'm seeing is just like hey a little slower a little that could slower. be a good topic for another episode it's just analyze impaired conversation <laughs> Oh, yeah. And everybody wants some by link later. They analyzed Twilight Zone episode while they were high, which is really interesting. And it I mean, makes was... sense, right? Because you would want to talk about Twilight Zone when you're high. <laughs> it's it, that seems yep. like a great show to talk about. And and it was the 70s. So it was more applicable back applicable back then. And it's it's kind of the topic you want to cover and you don't want to be too stereotypical, I think. But link letters like link letters got it. Like he's got something different than what other people have. So it's yeah. I, and I mean, the drunk acting is hard to do this. Yeah, it is. And that's why when you see people doing it, it's good. You're like, oh, OK, you nailed it. So it's, like a Judd Apatow is a master to like, yeah, like all the conversations and knocked up and, and other movies that they had. Yeah, they're, that's all just like, well, I think Seth Rogen, and all those guys are just big stoners anyway. So they know exactly how to get into the mind <laughs> frame of that. But yeah, it's it's tough, man. And, and but like this movie doesn't really ever. It never tackles like the emptiness of the life. Like Coughlin dies because he's too ambitious. It never tackles like how empty his life is. And I'm not saying if you're a bartender, your life is empty, but Coughlin's life was. I mean, Coughlin it was. He, yeah. And so I'm not I'm not speaking of other bartenders. I'm just saying Coughlin was. But you know what, though? That's why he tried to leech on Cruz a little bit. That's why he showed up. Like, I think he was just. I don't know. He still had the, he, but see, when you're a bartender, you know how to talk to people quickly because it's so many micro interactions. So you just got to know how to be fast and like how to mm-hmm. respond and like, Oh, gotcha. Yeah. 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 So are you, you know, just throw out wisdom or like, listen, like that's, they know how to like work for tips. So he, he's a pro at that, but outside of the club, he doesn't really have much going on. I'd say the, the counterpoint to that night, I agree with you. They, they hinted to the <laughs> lifestyle in the movie. Uh, I think they went into it more in the book, but I mean, I saw a lot of the criticism of the movie where they talked about how they wanted to gl- make this glossy, you know, bartending, you know, uh, environment. But I mean, like movies make so many different professions more sexy than they actually are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how many sexy journalists and writers are in movies? I mean, like in every rom-com, someone's a sexy journalist or writer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it, it's it's like it's a cool job, but I have news for you. Like you're sitting there typing, you know, it's, it's not that sexy You're advertising. I mean, advertising is cool. You're dealing with the clients, but you're spending a ton of time, you know, in front of a computer analyzing metrics yeah. <laughs> or editing you know? or like, ed- yeah, writing and or going rewriting. back and forth, like with a client. Oh, I don't really like that. You know, or you're in like, in a, you're doing like a focus group to see what messaging works on the ads. Like it's, 
when I mean, someone... it's interesting but it's not as sexy as they make it look police work buddy cop movies people yeah. make police work look more sexy than it is there's so many more movies and that would be my argument because if you're like oh well they made it seem more exciting you know than it than than reality well i'm like no crap everything in movies is seems better sometimes like what do you what do you think about that analysis that a lot of critics gave but I, I think they're right. I mean, or you're right. You you got to make it sexier. And and they even said here that someone said that the original script was one of the best screenplays I'd ever read. But when Tom came in, the movie had to change. The studio made the changes to protect the star and it became a much slighter movie because of it. And 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 yeah. who's going to go watch a movie about a bartender's decline into depression over 10 years? You know, you're not going to want to watch that. And so... Nope. You speed it up, you make it faster. I mean, and and listen, they didn't do a total script rewrite. They did just a they did edits, and I think that's what affected it. But yeah, man, like you're not. But listen, dude, there are some cool bartending jobs. Like there are, like there's some fun gigs that you can have in the moment. So it's, I think I think they did a good job of like capturing the lifestyle and the flair of it. But it's still, I don't know. It's just it's still it becomes a movie with no message, and not, not every movie needs a message. But there's really not. There's really he's just an awesome dude who becomes more awesome at the end. Right? It's <laughs> well, yeah, he finds a he grows up. Yeah. I think that's how he summarizes the movie. A man grows up is probably the, <laughs> the way I best way I could describe this movie. But he never has any like horrifying tri trials or tri tribulations, you know, he just sort of grows up. But it I don't know. It it he, he has to become grown up. Like it, it doesn't it, it just doesn't feel organic. But as far as the bartending goes, I mean this was the 80s man like the most the, like think about every bar though and like you said they're they're big they're bad like night the roxbury like those clubs aren't aren't like oh, those clubs yeah. are empty as hell but they look fun like that's just the whole vibe so yeah i i think you have to make it more fun you can't just show the ugly complexity of the job and like the color of money works though because it's going from pool hall to pool hall to pool hall to pool hall to pool hall. So you have different people, different pool halls, different setups. Yeah. So the guy's kind of a protagonist and an antagonist at the same time. And then you got Newman and like uh, what Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. She's like really good in that. And I think you're you can you can be more realistic when you're going from place to place to place. But if that bar was just a crap hole, if the Jamaican bar was just like a, if everything was cynical in cocktail, it wouldn't it wouldn't work in regards to like having Tom Cruise in it. I think. So, well, yeah. And I, I think what's interesting about starting a bar is it's a dream for so many people too. Yeah. I mean, so many people dream of having their own bar. I mean, you see this a lot, like it would be amazing, right? Like yeah. it's your own little, it's your, your own little universe that you can create. If you start your own bar, what kind of drinks, what kind of clientele, the vibe. I mean, it's, it's very aspirational though. I, when you think about it. I mean, think like, and also, I mean, in, in a nice setting, man, some of the best conversations you can have is in a bar. Like, you know how many great conversations have been had in a bar? Like, you can really- Business deals. Yeah. yeah like relationships. You can, like, you meet people, you experience things, you get turned down, you learn to deal with rejection, you learn to deal with acceptance, you meet people, you you have wild nights that you, you can talk about for years. So I, I think, I think that's great. But then once you learn about the hours and then you got to keep, you, know, you got to deal with your distributors and then you got to get the kegs or keg lines cleaned and then you got the inspections uh, and then you get just you know clientele you may not like and then you get people coming in and it's you're kind of rolling the dice with who comes in so i think it's a dream and it would be cool to have a successful bar that runs perfectly but nothing does so it's no there's a lot of trial and error that happens with, with bars too yeah and like listen like it's cool going to a bar once a week and i don't do that it's cool to go. On, it's cool going to a bar and, and meeting some people and having a cool conversation. But if that's every night of your life, like, that's going to get a little old. So it's yeah, I don't know. And it's but yeah, a lot of people do want to open up bars, but uh, open up a pub. Yeah, you can have some good talks. You can get chats. an Irish pub in a box. Uh, there's companies. What they do is they purchase a bunch of knickknacks and things from from Ireland, and then they sell everything you need for like the wood paneling and. and and then you you get a space and then you get this couple containers that come in this boom you just install it and it's instant irish pub there's a there's a freakonomics episode about it that's really interesting if you want to <laughs> listen to it you know it's crazy when i was out in in ireland and when i when i was like in the uk there were chains and they were all pubs and you walk in and you're like oh it's a pub but then you quickly get you look at the menu and you're like oh it's just another oh schmitzky's 
It's like, yeah, they, <laughs> they it's a corporate chain, but they made themselves look like pubs. And so you're like, oh man, what? But they, but I mean, I, I, we went to the Pelican in St. Pete. There is a certain charm to dive bars. Like there's a certain authenticity to some of them. That's fun. So it's, yeah, you're right. It, it, it and but that move this this movie though is it's not really about the clientele because they leave from it so fast and then you have the yuppies and then the drink like it's it becomes less about bartending it's just a weird movie man i don't yeah you're right you know what the other interesting part about this is um the pregnancy at the end and and i'm like all right i didn't see that coming but i think it was like these days pregnancy is a plot device you don't get that a lot anymore in movies and, and shows and i started researching i mean you had like juno knocked up you know nine months was from the 90s of course but like the the, the pregnancy is the the central pivotal point of a, a movie you don't see that very often anymore this seems like it was very 80s 90s yeah. back then and this is a third right am i am i wrong and this or, is like I a, mean, there's a third yeah. act pregnancy well i mean fast times at ridgemont high uh, but that was know, that was late 80s yeah like, early 90s like late eight, no early 80s that movie came oh, out okay. so yeah i think yeah like she's having a baby and like they're like it's just such an easy device to write around junior a Arnold Schwarzenegger drama, had a baby like it's remember that i i do i don't i don't think i've seen it uh yeah it's like okay nine months uh, there it, it just it doesn't happen in film anymore this right? one just felt so like yeah and then he's like okay well i gotta grow up because of this like he didn't grow up naturally he's like i just gotta i gotta grow up because of this and then there's a there's a very aggressive fight at their house <laughs> it's, it's oh uh, yeah with like the 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 butler and yeah the security guy and it was there's too much it was so unbelievable but it's so and fun she's to watch to, she's mid-20s right mid-20s and like you know her dad has that much control over her in her mid-20s and it's Seems like a very unhealthy relationship. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should get out of there. But yeah, it, yeah. But yeah, as far as pregnancies go, I guess I haven't thought too many much about that. I mean, I mean, if you look at movies, um, like a obvious child, that's been a that thing lately. Mm -hmm. Horror movies deal with pregnancies a lot because there's this really? element. Yeah, I mean, the Quiet Place, Dawn of the Dead, Birth, Rebirth, like pregnancies are big in movies. Like it, it because it the horror of. A pregnant woman being attacked or like what could happen like i think that oh, leads a, some having a baby in a pot it was in um the zombie show right what was that zombie yeah, one? Like, <laughs> walk, uh, dawn of the dead there was a zombie baby what like yeah. walking dead walking people dead. are pregnant yeah. like it's it, it's like it, it, it just it, adds to the dread yeah and like it's like if monsters weren't enough we're gonna have a pregnant woman and then we're gonna have a place where monsters are alerted by sound and we're gonna have a baby like so it's it's just adding tension on tension it's just That's right. they had to put the baby in the the soundproof box right yeah with and the it, oxygen flowing into it and it's like guys like monsters that can hear things are scary enough <laughs> you, you don't have to add more into it but it, the movie's made bank so whatever but yeah it's I mean, it's easy it forces people and also too like it forces people to change so a character's like oh like knocked up right paul rudd's like well oh, not paul rudd seth rogan's like i gotta get my life together and then he goes and gets his life together because of the kid. So it's, it's, it's just, it's easy. It's easy. I think that was the easiest thing for him. Not just change because he wants to be with this cool woman. <laughs> it's like, no, I have to change because she has, she's having my kid. It's yeah. Knocked up was interesting. There are a lot of undertones there. I think they're almost lampooning themselves in movies. Like the not so good looking guy with a beautiful woman. Like, you know, yeah. That, you know, I, so I, I did this, I'm working on this R rated rom-com piece. And I've been going through yeah. R-rated rom-coms and the Apatonian rom-coms really sort of changed the whole vibe of R-rated rom-coms there for a while because you had the 40-year-old virgin, then you had Knocked Up, then you had Trainwreck. He has a very specific, a 40-year-old version he produced. No, for Game Star Marshall. He kind of mm -hmm. changed the R-rated game there for a little bit, kind of like man dudes or women dudes growing up <laughs> because their significant others are, are better than them. It's an interesting thing that they, we went through in the early 2000s i'm glad we're past forgetting that era. sarah marshall i think forgetting sarah marshall was a classic though i mean it's just well because there's the so much to it ever right seen. like it's suspenseful because he goes to the same stupid island mia Kun kunis is very likable even though she's crazy like available but she's super likable siegel's funny he lays it all out too it's not just like 
you know, he, he literally bookends the movie with, with he does Siegel. so many funny things yeah. too. And, and Bill Hader, you had the funny of uh, the supporting see, characters. Funny. Paul Rudd pops up, Kristen Wig, like yeah, that's top to bottom funny. Like it works. And then he ends up growing up, everyone grows up. So I guess it that's like if you did power rankings, that's up there. I think that's like a tier one R rated rom com. When Harry met Sally's up there. Mm-hmm. Like I think you got it, you gotta have that. But I want to watch this new one with Glenn Powell. I can't wait for this new it's one. It's great, out. man. Set it up too. I love set it up from back in the day. He and Zoe Deutsch. Yeah, that was a good one. They're wonderful. Yeah, so I mean this one looks fun. I like Glenn Powell. Glenn E. P. Yeah, me too. So I got a funny story about cocktail. I, um, I'm watching this and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in this environment where there's not a lot going on. And I, I told my friend, my friend, Ben, uh, he's actually from the bad at magic podcast. I uh, highly recommend it, but Ben does, he doesn't drink. It's just, he doesn't do it. Um, and I recommended this movie to him. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think I didn't put the two new together, but I was like, Ben, what's interesting about this movie is you think it's all flashy, but it's really, there's a lot of undertones here. So I think it's interesting watch, even though it's not the best movie, but I recommend it. Then he watched it as a (laughs) non-drinker. So he's like, it's completely foreign, you know, not completely foreign, but seeing it through that, that perspective. But he's the one that picked up on the pregnancy as a plot device example. And uh, he brought up Elizabeth Shue, the quintessential 80s girlfriend. Oh, yeah. So. Elizabeth Shue had a pretty strong run. I don't I don't think she's credited for as many awesome movies. The Back to the Future movies, Karate Kid, this one, and, and many others. But she had a pretty, uh, she was in beast mode for a while in the 80s. I don't think people realize how many hits she was in. Oh, dude. Like, yeah. What karate? She's stacked with how much she's done. Like, but what, I mean, I feel like she's overlooked because she's in such a big part of 80s pop culture. I mean, if you watch Back to Future Part Two, that cocktail, Adventures of Babysitting, Karate Kid, like around that area, you're like she's all. You know what I think? You know what I think? Aside from Back to the Future, I think my first Elizabeth Shue movie that we watched was Leaving Las Vegas. So like that was like my first yeah, dealing right. with her at twelve as a what the 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 sex worker who hooks up with Nick Cage and then it was she wins so an Oscar. So different from her eighties. We're working the eighties. Yeah, it was yeah, polar and it was, opposite. And she hooks up with another alcoholic. But I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, she's great. And then, <laughs> I didn't really realize about her 80s career, but no, no, she was everywhere. Like she was, and she's still crushing it nowadays. She's I mean, still in... what what other women have had that big of a run? I mean, it's an honest question that I, I know maybe. I mean, well, you got Julia, like, Roberts. Julia Robert, but she, I mean, obviously she was the star, whereas you know, Elizabeth, she was a supporting actor in a lot of these. But I think she should get credit for being up there for some of the best run of movies. Um, for I mean, all actors, but especially women because i mean she's just in so many that you know i mean karate kids and all-timer adventures of babysitting is just like a super cult classic cocktails a cult classic i mean the back to the future movies are gigantic so yeah i mean heart and souls oh i mean i mean the yeah if you just kind of look and then yeah she did and then she just kind of keeps popping up and staying in films i wish i had a a long list on imdb i wish i long like in the 80s, right? I think Daphne Zuniga had a great one. Spaceballs, The Sure Thing. She popped up in a bunch of... Fabi Cates was like in Gremlins and Fast Times. She had a good run there. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, man. Who's the lady? Who's the... Gen- D- Dirty Dancing. What was her name? She was Jennifer... B... No. Gen- Jennifer Gray. Because she was yes. in C- Caddyshack. Not Caddyshack. Mm-hmm. She was in Uncle Buck. And then that... Yeah, she had a good run as well. <sighs> like the 80s quintessential. Like 80s famous 1980 you're at jennifer oh, gray oh, Elizabeth bro Shue. like what about the brat pack the um molly ringwald in the 80s mm-hmm. she was like hitting yes like she was she was hitting on all cylinders there uh, 1980s ali sheedy had a good michelle pfeiffer was blown up she had like scarface and lady yeah, hawk right. i know we're just naming names right now uh, who who i mean i own sky she wasn't saying anything i love that movie i'm gonna give it to i'm gonna give it to our girl elizabeth Shue. she was crushing it that was a big run. I mean, I think she was close to winning the eighties. <laughs> one of the one of the top actors, in my opinion. Oh wow! Because let's see, Breakfast Club. I mean, Molly had like she, her her she her just had like what Breakfast Club and Pretty in Pink and Sixteen mm-hmm. Candles. She just had a beast mode run there. 
as far as like John Hughes movies? This is an interesting question. I'm going to have to look into this more. This is a tough one to okay. pop on me, but I like it. Yeah, you know, because it involves a lot of research, too. I got, I got one more question for you here. Yeah. The, the title of the movie, Cocktail, it's perfect. But it's like the name of it is not about the movie isn't about cocktails. It's about somebody growing up and a whirlwind romance. And but it, the name is so simple, but it's so perfect. Right. Yeah, it's cocktail. What else are you going to name it? It's just mm. it's so perfect, even though the movie isn't necessarily about cocktails. They don't really talk. I mean, they mention it in his bar poetry. But outside of that, in the, oh, in Jamaica, he mentions a couple of drinks. But it's such a like, you think it's about cocktails, but it's nothing to do. I mean, it's about the art of bartending, but it's not about the drink itself. So, I, I just thought it was interesting how the the name of the movie was it's it's so memorable, it's iconic, but it's not exactly kind of what the movie's about. I just thought it was a perfect name. Yeah, let's go see cocktail. Like, what does he do? I mean, he makes cocktails. You see it on posters. You see Tom Cruise. You see Cocktail, Tom Cruise Bartender. I think it's brilliant <laughs> marketing, in my opinion. And these are movies that only work in the 80s, 90s when when they were star driven films. So it's like, you know, watch Will Smith be a watch. Watch Adam Sandler be an angry golfer. Like it's watch Will Smith be a <laughs> be a golf caddy. Watch uh, Jim Carrey not lie. Watch him be a, a pet detective. <laughs> okay so like it's cocktail he's just dealing cocktails like what's this let's go see this should be a, a more of like yeah, a sampler it relies on the star power so you just it's like the the title doesn't need to be that descriptive it just has to kind of give you a general idea of tom cruise bartender <laughs> like right I mean, it's just it's so easy because it works so well in all the marketing yeah and it's do you know the posters him just looking serious with his hand on a bar like it, i don't even know what that says about this movie there's also there's like a pink neon light this is cocktail too with him smiling when it's... he when he pours he rains is that what it says yeah so it's when if you looked at this poster eric and you knew nothing about cocktail what would you think it is which which, which poster are you looking at the one I, where I'm he has his, about the... Th there's so there's a picture of him just he has his hand on the bar and he has a black shirt and he has another one on his hips and he's just looking at the camera it's I, I don't I, I guess he's it's just saying like this is going to be suspenseful like this is Wall oh, Street yeah. with but it looks like he's at a, at a bar but he's not smiling in it he's no. serious <laughs> just so like, he wouldn't go see cocktail I don't know what's it about well um I guess he just pours drinks yeah it sounds you're good that to me. big of a star you could just stand there with your hand on a bar without an actual drink without an actual cocktail <laughs> You're that big, and you could sell uh, a movie. <laughs> like I love that the trailer has the the sex scenes. It has the basketball. It has some yelling. It doesn't really quite say what it is. But yeah, so I found one thing I want to read that just makes me happy. So uh, I, I forget where I pulled this from. He's like, in case you haven't seen Cocktail or haven't seen it in a while, you should know it's kind of insane. It takes place in three acts across New York and Jamaica. Cruz's character is a working class guy from Queens who's striving to become an '80s era yuppie. Yet he settles for a relatively quiet life, owning a small bar and raising a family. An enormous shift his character makes in a few minutes. There's a suicide. There's a waterfall sex scene. There's a very angry father who appears in a third act that wraps up way too quickly. It's a remarkably fast recovery. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what, though? That's why this movie works. I'm telling you, the, the movies that live the longest on cable are the ones where you can just put them on. And something happens and it moves to the next thing. Like you don't want to dwell in, you don't want to watch leaving Las Vegas. Wasn't on TNT every night. Like it, it's not a movie you want to watch all the no. time. That's why cocktails good. Oh man. Some, someone called this movie flat beer from rusty pipes. They borrowed a line <laughs> in the movie to slam it. One guy just said very, very stupid. I'm looking at top critics. Cocktail is a meandering shapeless film. That's true. Yeah, that is true. It's very, you know, without the force of character to resist any of the cliches, that's that's unfair. I mean, it's just, but but it is meandering. It is shapeless. Yeah, I don't it even just know. exists. But you know what though? That's why this movie has a personality. It has a personality because I've never seen a movie this shapeless before. So when you're watching it, you're like, wait, that was a big turn. Oh, he's in Jamaica now. Oh, he just body slammed Elizabeth Shue in the water. Like, why is Kelly Brook 
showing up. Oh, wait, why is Kelly LeBrock showing? No, not Kelly. I'm I'm mixing up all my Kellys right now. Why is Kelly? Why is Roadhouse here? Kelly Lynch here. Speaking like, of Roadhouse, wasn't there a a bartender in Roadhouse that got beaten up all the time? Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. I mean, so <laughs> that's one of my favorite bartenders in film. The guy that gets beaten up in Roadhouse. <laughs> That's why bar- yeah, bartenders don't fight. That's why you leave it up to the bouncers. Yeah, they need their hands to make drinks. They yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> breaking any hand. Yeah, you don't you don't want the bouncers fighting. You don't want the bartenders fighting. You want the bouncers. Yeah. That's why baseball players never throw punches because they're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need those hands. <laughs> Let's leave it to the bouncers. Like I don't go back there and make your martinis, so don't come out here and fist fight with me. Yeah, you should have a bar just for dentists because because like they're not punching anyone. They need their hands for. Like- <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna be like the orthopedic the, surgeon. <laughs> yeah, bar. dentists and baseball players are welcome. There's gonna be no fighting. <laughs> I'm gonna find like a big dental place, like a very successful one, and open up a bar next to it. Just called Teeth. Just the most chill bar. Gums. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, gums and, dr- and dreams and dreams. Hey, hey man, could you have plastic cups? Like I can't squeeze the glass. It'll hurt my hands. So just I don't know if dentists speak like that, but you know they're not punching anybody. You're good. It's just until you if meet you're like, a bouncer, you don't have to throw anyone out. Like, hey, not the hands. Okay, so what then? <laughs> like, just yeah. But yeah, well, I'm I'm glad you talked about this movie. I know I know we we digressed a decent amount, but there's not much to this movie, so it's kind of fun to chat about the other tropes that it goes through and how crews learn from it, and and also too, like yeah. this movie doesn't take the greatest view of, of women either. You have Gina, I mean. Gina Gershon cheats on him. Kelly Lynch tries to cheat. And then you get a little, like, it's, but it's, it's such an 80s movie, though. That's what the 80s were. It's, it's like 80s in a bottle, this film. You have the 80s yuppies. You have all the music. Everyone wanting to be rich. I mean, yeah. everyone want to make, yeah. The music, the hair. Yeah. The clubs. It's extremely male driven, male point of view all the way. I mean, it was like an unreal. <laughs> You know what I like, though? This is a movie about a dude who he doesn't become great. He's just like, yeah, I opened up a bar. Like, it's cool. <laughs> it's it's kind of nice that he doesn't become like the, the greatest bar guy. Oh, it's not like Scarface where he, he's broke. Then he rises to power. Then it all collapses. Like he just starts a bar, like a small bar. Yeah, I guess that's that could be the summary of the movie. Man starts bar. <laughs> I like the one you bar. don't trust Jamaican bar. Don't trust J- dudes in Jamaican bars so, at resorts. Oh, don't, don't, trust... don't trust a bartender at a Jamaican resort. <laughs> like if they're Jamaican, you can trust them. But if they yeah. move down to be yeah. at the resort just to make money, don't trust them. Shifty. See, that would not be fun bartending because that's just vacationers wanting to be served. And like when you go to a resort, you expect to be served because you're paying so much money. Like that's boring bartending. If you work in a pub in New York, you're still serving people, but it's more about the, the, the feel. There's a community, there's a yeah. community yeah. vibe to it. Yeah, you could tell though he was bored. He was bored as hell in Jamaica. You could, you could tell in the in the movie, and I, I did appreciate that. Mm, it's true. He wasn't living it up. It's an odd movie, Eric. <laughs> but Would Tom- you recommend this movie? I made the mistake of recommending it to my friends. No, who doesn't uh, drink? Uh, but would you, you don't recommend want, though, it to anybody? Like, have are you a Tom Cruise fan? Do you want to see a movie that like changed his career for the better after making it? Because he's all about story now. Like Tom Cruise, he pushes story hard. He wants a good story, and I think after this, his filmography changed, and he learned from it. So if you're a Tom Cruise completist, watch it because you'll see the evolution of his character. That's a great point. I think it, it's on brand for for the podcast here, movies, films, and flicks, because we we try to look at you know the flops and the good ones and and see the see what's good about it, see what what's learned, and look at the positives from these movies. This movie made a lot of money and it played on cable forever, so it, it obviously connected with people. Yeah, if you Google best bartenders in film, Flanagan's on it, you even what, though the movie sucked. You know what this teaches me? It's like let's find a profession that no one does and let's just make a bad movie. Because then whenever people are like, here's the best movies featuring rare coin collectors, like we're going to be one in every single list, even if our movie stinks, because it's so niche. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. There's enough movies about police and lawyers and journalists. Let's, let's find something out of, out of the ordinary. 
best movie about a cupcake maker, but only cupcakes with bottoms. Well, The Hangover, you had Ed Helms was a dentist. I mean, that was interesting. Yeah. You had uh, uh, Matthew Perry, rest in peace. He was a dentist, right? In the yeah, whole nine, whole nine yards. yards. Steve so, Martin was you know, a dentist. Right. Yeah, let's, let's do a rare coin collector. So whenever that comes up, the best rare coin collecting. It's like Matthew McConaughey in Circular Gold. He's riding a Buick and just analyzing. <laughs> or Silver <laughs> Circle. He's just in his Lincoln going, oh, hey. Oh, oh Lincoln. Lincoln. Did I say Buick? Yeah. Like, oh, man. Oh, hey, right. check out this uh, new uh, silver coin I got. Yeah. It's a... I need to, to check go it out. cruise and hit the road yeah, let's because go. I got to check out some coins. Let's go palm this. Like, let's go see how much this is worth. All right. Only 100, only 100 miles to go in my Lincoln. See this little bad boy right here? Road. See this little bad boy right here? 1973 commemorative. Pew. And then you have some close up magic and it disappears. And then Earl's up front going, Yeah, that's great, boss. Say, hey, man, where'd my coin go? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> I think we're, the coin collector. <laughs> Sponsored by Lincoln. Silver Circle. What would be like a good word title for this movie? Where, where does the drama come from? Is, is he, you know, in bidding wars or does he get robbed? Say, man. It's... You're like, someone's after my coins. <laughs> oh, we got to go. What do these coins teach us about life? Hey, man. <laughs> the 1783, the bloom that I have. It was very valuable. <laughs> Man, he's, he's trying to find some shipwrecks. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Looking for coins. Oh, hey, man. I uh, I hear off the coast of uh, California, there's a shipwreck. with Some doubloons in it. And then it, it all just goes to heck. I mean, it's basically the, the thing of fool's gold. We we're just explaining fool's gold to people. Fool's gold. Wasn't that in the, the desert? No, it's like him and Kate or Hudson. That, that was oh, Sahara. Sahara, he goes after gold coins. Yeah. <laughs> goes after a boat hey man what's going on no, let's just, just put sahara in the caribbean you know the, the caribbean he's he's what? like there and he's um scuba diving looking for wrecks but he does that in fool's gold he looks for treasure in fool's gold <laughs> hey man <laughs> let's go visit some old I, war I don't, remember, I don't remember that at all was was that the salma hayek or the kate hudson one that's the kate hudson one was that was that before the reconnaissance or was that was that when he was doing yeah. the height wrong yeah, that, was, that was before it reconnaissance started with lincoln lawyer uh okay great books by the way oh yeah i love that movie i wrote about it for on tomatoes you should read it but yeah, it's uh, it, it's a uh, yeah hey man i've been to i've been to the desert and i've been to the the bahamas let's go something different let's go to louisiana I'm sure I can see true. McConaughey as I can see him as a bartender. Yeah. Maybe a fun bartender. Yeah. Because I mean he has that Texas vibe. Just chatting with people. Yeah. Making hey, them man. feel welcome. How you doing? I like this bar already. <laughs> <laughs> what does this guy do different? He just chats with people. Does he like hook up with customers or do anything fancy? No, he just he has a real welcoming presence. He's just a cool guy that people want to hang out with. It's a great business model. Like he doesn't, he's not flipping anything. He's just really pleasant to be. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he has an illegal coin ring thing going on here, but everyone's like really chill about it. So it's not like drugs. So I just let him go away with it. Just don't touch his blooms. Just a side hustle. Like, say, man, you talking about my blooms? <laughs> it's fine, man. I just check him. That's awesome, man. I had fun uh, with this one, dude. Yeah, this is great. Hey, this well, thank, thank you for joining me, Eric. My pleasure. All right, so for me, Mark Hoffmeyer. For Eric Hoffmeyer, this is Movies from the Flicks. We'll see you next week.